that song I just never understood why you play such a sad song and tell them to cheer up you know, <laughs> sad sounding song oh let's stand together welcome Grace Baptist Church let's uh, sing together the solid rock Sweetest friend, that only we know Jesus' name. 
His blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. I press the sun and wrap the sand, all other ground is sinking sand.
tendency to not decrease as I should and allow the Lord to increase when I'm speaking. I have opinions and I have to separate those. So I've tried really hard to focus on Christ and let him be the focus of this evening. So, so let us pray first. Heavenly Father, I come before you knowing that I am unworthy and uh, I'm not prepared to give the message you would have me to give without the help of your Holy Spirit. May I be focused on you, your word, not my own opinions and my own ideas. Let me say clearly and as, uh, as uh, special as I can what you would have to for me to say tonight and for those to hear. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. I keep trying to this uh, right away I'm going to something. I try to keep moving around in here if nobody's noticed. These, where I sit, these are the most unflattering cameras <laughs> I have ever seen. Whatever your worst feature is, they focus on it and it uh, expands it and makes it prominent for, for all to see. 
that's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of technology. Anybody that knows me, I preach that in Sunday school and everywhere that I get a chance. I wanted to start with a story last night, uh, this evening, about a date that I had back in my 20s, many moons ago. And she was a beautiful young lady, and I was especially uh, looking forward to my date with her because she actually, through her mother, said that she wanted to go out with me. And that doesn't happen to guys very much when we're used to getting shot down and things like that. But the, the thought of somebody actually making the move first. So I did meet her at a restaurant. And I thought that after we made small talk that I would uh, fascinate her with my brilliant knowledge on, on certain subjects which included the history of rock and roll and sports. So after I thought I did a very a fascinating presentation of my skill and knowledge in these areas, she looked me in the eye and said, that's the most useless bunch of information that I've ever heard. Do you know anything of value? Do you know anything that makes money? And I thought, that's a, that's a stupid question. That, that was what was important to me. And later on in life, I ran into somebody when I was staying at a hotel, actually, and I was down by the pool, and they were reading something spiritual. I don't know if it was the Bible, but something that I felt led to start a conversation. And he started rapid firing all this scripture and going into the script, it sounded like, about all sorts of things that I didn't agree with. And I couldn't get a word in edgewise. Somebody told me later that it was either a Jehovah's Witness or it was somebody, but he knew his stuff. He was prepared. So I, I've learned through life the importance when it comes to being a Christian of having some knowledge to work with. Though the Holy Spirit helps you and he's there, it's really good for him to have something to work with when you're looking for him to bring something to your mind while you're witnessing or in a situation where you're a little bit lost in there. So there is uh, certainly be a debate on what is useless information. However, I believe that we all should be able to agree that knowledge regarding God, His Son, Jesus, and the Word Bible is never without value and should be preeminent in our quest for knowledge. Any other discipline of wisdom or philosophy is excuse me, insignificant in comparison to that as a Christian. <clears throat> Whether it's given a defense of our faith or teaching our children or reaching out to others, uh, biblically, it is a demonstration of our love for Christ and a sign of obedience and our love for Him, for them. So here are just a sample of some familiar verses confirming our obligation, and I believe we probably hear these often on Sunday mornings. And I'm usually, I try to use more, for lack of a better word, obscure verses, because the same ones are used all over, and there's so much. But I can't think of anything that's better than these uh, to make this point. This first one is 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17, and this is from the Amplified Bible, which I rarely read. I grew up on the King James Version and American Standard, and that's pretty much where I stay. But this made it a little bit clearer for me. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and faith and confident assurance that is within you with gentleness and respect. Amen. Deuteronomy 6, 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. I believe that God's Word is clear that we are to be about our Father's business 24-7. I'm in the process of becoming recertified to represent uh, Medicare and different kinds of other insurance and annuities. Talk about rejection. I mean, if you've got a fear of witnessing to somebody or talking to them, you ought to go out and try talking about insurance. <laughs> you get prepared. Amen. There's an epidemic of insurance derangement syndrome in this country. It's almost like presenting the gospel. 
you don't really get used to it, but you learn how to deal with it. So I thought, I've learned how to deal with other things in life, but do I put out the same effort to be prepared emotionally and mentally and spiritually to present the gospel? I am in no means, another thing you'll learn about me, my, my password when I was in this insurance company was, I hate tech. <laughs> that shows you how I value phones and everything else. And I'm not a big fan of marketing. To me, most of it's either deceitful or outright lie. Amen. I love commercials as well. But one of the ways that people in the Medicare field promote themselves is by having signs on their car, big buttons on their shirt, or t-shirts or something that testify to the fact that they speak Medicare. That's a term that they use so that somebody who they feel is baffled out there, they, they can come to the rescue. My question tonight, and it has been for me for a while, is can I and we say with authority that we are qualified to speak God? In my opinion, everybody is qualified to reveal the reality of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter what our level of spiritual comprehension may be, that's not an excuse. With the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a sincere desire to be obedient to God and His Word in loving the lost, we have the foundation, no matter where we're at, for a starting point on our quest to hopefully, eventually hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. However, we are called to put ourselves and our lives in totality as an epistle to the lost. I was staying at the Hampton Inn right outside, it wasn't right in Tallahassee, we was outside of that probably 15 years ago. It was there because David Jeremiah was holding a conference there uh, in Tallahassee. And got in late and went to bed. And I got up the next morning. I went down to where they have their famous continental breakfast and to get some coffee. I was awash in a sea of garnet and gold. Now, if those of you don't know who that is, this is Seminole country that I was in. Their attire, the messages in the form of vehicle adornments and conversations I overheard I was suggest, subjected to, left no doubt who they were. Mm -hmm. Their knowledge of the team and the game that was to take place later that day was impressive. On display was a deep connection with the team. Frequently they spoke as if they were the team. <laughs> they never referred to it as they should do this. Yeah. It's we should do this. And that's the way we're supposed to be for God. We, Amen. part of the church, as part of our community, and as part of the body of Christ. No one would doubt their zeal and passion. And I am sure that, that many conversations throughout the week, not just that one day, testified to that passion and zeal. Now this display of knowledge and activities to confirm it are not limited to what I call the Knowles. I went to Venice visit a guy named Lenny who helped me frequently at, at a major nursery here when I had my landscape business. And he was called Lenny the Knoll because we had this ongoing thing all the time. And you had no doubt who he supported, who he was. So I went to visit Lenny the Knoll. That was one of the things that I, I have to say that I've been pretty faithful doing in that visitation. When I had my company that afforded me the freedom of time and resources, I probably did a thousand visitations, visits a year between nursing homes, private homes, and the hospitals. And it didn't matter if they were Christians or not. And it opened a lot of doors. So I went to visit Lenny the Knoll. He was in for some sort of surgery. I don't remember what it was. And I got my hands on an Indian chief's headdress. 
And I walked into the hospital wearing that headdress to honor him as a Seminole. It was humility, and it was humiliating. But in this case, the ends did justify the means, and I was able to witness to him. Now, I'm using sports as an illustration, but there are numerous topics and passions that we have in our life that we can speak on with ease and confidence, and we should be able to do the same, being about our Father's business. At the church that I was at before, which was all gator, to proclaim that you were a bull gator, there were things that backed that up. First of all, I had no idea that it's like two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year to be a bull gator. That that shows passion and sincerity, uh, if nothing else does. But as a gator fan, you would also be expected to know what the outcome of the game was last week, who they were playing this week, who the head coach is when they won their first national championship, on and on and on. So having this knowledge and this ability to talk easily about subjects, it casts no doubts on who you are, what you think, and what you're passionate about. As, as I alluded to earlier, it's not only possible but commanded to share Christ regardless of your fluency in theology or scripture. I believe that our fears and Satan himself uses this fear or lack of knowledge to bind us. Amen. I don't think, now I'll put myself in the place of God, you're standing before God and he asks you, why did you not witness more? Why did you not do this in my kingdom? Why did you go, well, I wasn't equipped. I do this. My response would be, why not? What do you do about that? When I'm insurance, in insurance or I'm in something else I don't know, I research it to find out. I eliminate my ignorance in that area. And I'm so avid about doing that in things of the world, but I lack in doing the things of Christ. And that shouldn't be so. Amen. One of the things in insurance that I learned that was a common thing with new agents that you were training or anything like that, they would be apprehensive. There's a lot to know. Despite everybody telling you Uncle Bill knows everything, they don't need to talk to you, he doesn't. I don't know everything. I try to hire Uncle Bill, but he never seems to be available, since he's the only person on the planet that knows everything. But we used to comfort them and encourage them by saying, look, when you're talking about something in somebody's house, and it's a serious, honest need that they have, always remember, you know 10 times more than they do. And it's the same with our Christian faith. Can't live for decades as a Christian Christian without having a testimony. Amen. We know many times that the Lord didn't lead you there because you don't know as much as they do, but usually to learn, for them to learn from you. And we all have something that nobody else knows. I, uh, I had a friend in the insurance I was going to bring the card she sent me, but I forgot it. Her name was Amber. That was her American name. The Asians, especially Chinese, they take American names when they come here. Her father snuck in. She came legally when she was 10. See, there's a story right there. And this is an example of I did learn something from somebody that I probably knew more than. She was going to lose her job, and I started inviting her out on appointments, and I would share the commission with her. We became friends. She was half my age, pretty much half my height. We were very, very different, but we formed a friendship. And I was able to lead her to the Lord, and I hate saying that because it's not me, but you understand what I mean. It's not a boasting thing. 
And she sent me a card, and I always look at this when things fail, and I feel like I'm wasting my time, and I've had nothing but rejection and failure. And it thanked me for leading her to God and listed all the benefits that she got from that. When I lost everything and moved into a hotel, that's one of the few things that I kept, and I still have that on my dresser to this day. Whenever I feel what I'm doing is in vain, sometimes it bears fruit. Amen. But here's where I learned something from her. Amber was not a person afraid to share her opinions, unlike me. And one time I told her, <clears throat> I said, I was joking, I said, Amber, you need to set me up with a beautiful, young, rich Chinese girl. And she goes, Mike, no beautiful, young, rich Chinese girl want an old, broke white man. <laughs> so see, I learned something right there from the mouths of babes. And I didn't pursue that uh, you know, any farther. And Christian witnessing is a complete lifestyle, though, just like being a sports fan or other things in your life. And I'm not trying to minimize the importance of this. Revealing yourself as, you know, revealing yourself with biblical knowledge and being a Bible scholar is a plus. I'm not trying to minimize that. So I want to refer again to another story that is something that spoke but was not from Scripture but I believe made an impression and gave a testimony for Christ. I was in Publix maybe 20 years ago. I was in line checking out. And there was a couple of guys in front of me, obviously from a construction crew or something along those lines. And they were buying chicken and all the stuff they really can't afford. And his card didn't work. Tried, had several cards, tried them all, either the pin number or, you know, that darn machine. Oh, I can't say darn. That stupid machine uh, just didn't get it. And I asked the cashier, I said, well, how much is it? And it was like $20 and some change. And I said, I'll pay for it. And there was like this stunned silence. And she goes, I've been here 13 years. I've never seen anybody offer to pay for somebody else's groceries. And this guy was dumbfounded. And I was thinking, this was just no big deal. I don't go through Starbucks. I wouldn't go through Starbucks if they gave it to me. Because I'm not going to stand in line. Well, I don't care how good it is or what the price is. I just wouldn't do it. So by giving up some things, this was just 20 bucks that we drop at the drop of a hat. But it made an impression on him. And then I had fun with it. I went over to him. And I said, you know, take this as a blessing from God. And he says, man, I don't know what to say. And I said, well, I'm going to leave you with this. Sometimes you entertain angels unaware. And he goes, wow. <laughs> like I was Gabriel or something. But I left it there and I didn't elaborate. But let me tell you. I had open ears all the way around me for those few minutes Amen. based on the fact that I did something that Christians should do. I showed that I was different from the world, even though others do that. It was worth the 20 bucks to do that. So there are ways that I've been able to touch people that didn't include Ephesians and what is it, two, eight, nine, and you know, all the usual Roman road, and your lifestyle can open people's ears. Amen. So, as I illustrated, I spoke to the knowledge uh, earlier of sports or any other issue. So, I think it's reasonable to conclude that being able to speak God comfortably would greatly enhance our testimony and lead credence to our word, more than our shirt or the cross hanging around our neck. Amen. Let's consider these things. Should we be able to know the basic things about the Bible? Now, there were some statistics shared in Sunday school this morning, 
and I don't give them a lot of uh, credence because they're all over the place sometimes, and I don't trust that everybody always tells you the truth about things when confronted with things. But shouldn't we know the basic things about the Bible to illustrate that we take it serious? The word cretins is often referred to as demonstrating sincerity that you believe that something is true. Only a small minority of professing Christians, church attenders, could tell you how many books are in the Bible. By every poll taken, the numbers vary, but it's not a majority. The first and last books of the Bible. You get stares. And a majority have never read it through from beginning to end, not once. So as a resistant person that you're trying to share and influence that the Bible is the true word of God, is he going to have reservations and possibly concerns about that being true if you don't even study it? Amen. That is part of our witness. It's not enough that you don't drink, smoke, cuss, and have relationships outside of marriage. That's fine, and that's necessary, and that's commanded. But that's just the starting point is not doing the things you shouldn't do. You need to start doing the things that we should do. So, do we really convince somebody that we believe that our Savior and the Son of God, that Jesus is really our Savior and the Son of God, and you can't tell me anything about Him? I wouldn't take that person serious. Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You know that word sup? I never noticed that in there before. But I had a debate with my English teacher in senior year of high school. He said that wasn't a word. I used it in a short story or something. If I would have had this biblical reference to go to, I could have won that real easy. But as it was, ended up he's right and I'm wrong. So, I never considered this before, but I heard a sermon, and they used this scripture, something that they uh, elaborated on. Not all the time are we going to be able to lead that person all the way to Christ. Amen. But we can encourage them and convince them to consider it and open the door Amen. for him to come in. Amen. And we have a responsibility to do that. It's not ultimately our work. But just putting them in a position to consider it without animosity, without revulsion or resistance is important. I could count on my hand, hands, I will say hands, it's more than five, the number of people that I've led to Christ or felt that they profess Christ in my presence. You never know about seeds that you planted in that kind of thing. And that's it. In many instances, all I did, and a few of them I have my doubts about, whether it was sincere or not. People, employees and stuff would use me. They would show up to church. They would do things to get in my favor because they, they either wanted a raise, they wanted an advance on their check. Some guy, talk about being blinded, we spoke about that this morning, about how some people are blinded to the truth. How could any of them be around me for years, hear me preach at them, hear me share my testimony and my core beliefs, politically and otherwise, not know where I stand on abortion? This guy comes to me and wants me to loan him money to get his girlfriend to abortion. Seriously? I didn't even deal with it. Get away from me. They don't hear what they don't want to hear. Amen. We hear things that we want to hear and we grasp onto that. So, in many cases, revealing Christ in the light of who He truly is can encourage a doubting person to open that door. God in His holy door and His Holy Spirit will come through that open door. 
I do want to share one that just came to mind. They used to call it the porch. When I was going to witness to somebody in my, that worked for me, I built on an office at the end of my house. I was on five acres, and I had a building out there to house all my equipment and stuff. So if I took them out on the porch, they knew what was coming. Ugh. So I talked to this guy one time, and I guess just to shut me up or satisfy me, he ex- said he accepted the Lord. So I go walking out there to the building where all they're hanging out, and he's out there mocking me. He's dancing around going, I got Jesus, I got Jesus. I didn't react as I should. When he woke up, I fired him. I don't take that lightly, but I have to learn to take those kind of things. And that will happen, just like that beautiful letter from that girl that everything came out wonderful. You're going to have these experiences. So I'd like to say also about the importance of knowing and being prepared. Mark 13, 11 says, do not worry what you will say. The Holy Spirit will speak for you. And that's a given promise in many scriptures, especially uh, with the apostles when they were going in front of the Sanhedrin. But that's not for every instance in every situation. Sometimes we have a tendency to be unable to differentiate promises that are to a certain situation or to a certain person. I was raised on, at the feet of J. Vernon McGee. And he was telling a story. It's wonderful once these preachers retire, how they don't have to be as reserved and worry about politically keeping the church together and what they say being controversial. So he was invited to uh, speak at a church. And that he was going to speak at the evening service. And during the morning service, he listened to the pastor there that invited him give his message and his sermon. And he said, he claimed this word. He claimed this scripture. He says, I don't put a lot of effort in preparing my messages, claiming this verse and a couple of others. And McGee responded, yes, and it shows. <laughs> That's pretty presumptuous to go into situations. Give the Holy Spirit something to draw to your mind. So, most of us have a acquired a reservoir about knowledge of many things, as I stated earlier. However, this did not come to fruition or come to be a reality in our lives without time and effort. Church attendance and participation in all the things to do with the church is always a true testimony to our beliefs, but it's not an end all. It is our lifestyle overall. My radio, part of the thing I, things that I've done to make Christ more important in my faith, and part of my life, and you learn through some, some of it through osmosis. My radio has been turned to the tuned to the Bible Broadcasting Network for over 35 years exclusively. I say exclusively when I got a car once it had serious radio left on it for some while and a classic rock station came on. Yes, I listened to Jumpin' Jack Flash. I listened before I turned it over. I did that. Outside of that, it's on 24-7. Somebody comes in my house, they're going to hear the word because that radio was on all the time. And it's influenced me a great deal whether I notice it or not. So, and due to the music that I enjoy these days, gospel and spiritual songs, songs that pop in my head driving down the road are no longer Led Zeppelin or The Doors or any of these groups. They're not classic rock. They are classic gospel songs. I have uh, memorized dozens of songs. You know, I was thinking, why can't I sing through Amazing Grace when I've heard it 1,200 times this year alone? It didn't take much effort to put these things to memory. And I sing them throughout the day. I was in a Dollar Tree only about a year ago. And I was in the card aisle looking for a card for some reason. 
And I was singing victory in Jesus. So this guy from the next aisle over hears me. And he comes over and I see his head peek around. He goes, is that you singing? I said, guilty as charged. He said, that's wonderful. And we got to be friends. He runs a, uh, I guess it's is it North Central Baptist, Northwest, over there by the Santa Fe. They have a four o'clock Bible study on Wednesdays. And I began going there. Through that, I made that connection. So it's not always the case as I shared before. Some people are offended. So somebody told me one time they were offended at my singing. Another time, we as a group were in um, Steak and Shake. Somebody was offended by our praying before the meal. So having the reservoir of knowledge that I have now, I was able to drag up, drag up a great spiritual truth. I don't care. <laughs> There's sometimes that I'm not going to beat my head against the wall and this stuff has to come to a stop. We're the only ones that's open, and the Jews, that's it's open season on offending us. Is that the right attitude to have? I don't know. But I don't care. Usually they walk away and that puts an end to it. Amen. I'm too old to get in fights. I used to say either I can beat somebody up or outrun them and I don't think I can do either one anymore. So I always use discretion and discernment in what I do these things. I first spoke about these things, at least in part, uh, about 10 years ago. I know it was a Sunday that was October the 31st, because I remember it was Halloween. So I started off by asking people if they knew the significance you know, of this day. And the pat answer was, it's Halloween. So I went through, you know, did my talk and all that other kind of stuff. The fact of the matter is, is that why everybody knows that it's Halloween, for us, like understanding and knowing the 4th of July and other events in the world, that was the day that Protestantism began when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on a church called the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. 19, in 1517, what we are today, that movement began officially, even though it was an undercurrent of that uh, during the entire time. I listened to something called This Day in Christian History. There's something to learn every day. It's maybe trivia. Some people listen to ESPN, pick up sports trivia. That's fine. But you can't do that kind of stuff in expense, at the expense of learning about God and His Word in quiet time. Also, I want to share the value and importance of personal quiet time. Again, I'm not taking anything away from corporate worship, but just coming and sitting here and even participating and absorbing. I've even started taking notes when Tom speaks. I'm trying to be more serious about opportunities to learn and not just sit there and go, I would have said that different. People who speak have a tendency to think they would always do it different and better. Yeah. Even though, <laughs> right? Amen. So, anyway. So this day in Christian history, little things like that have been able to allow me to have some college, some knowledge to draw on in specific circumstance, and it keeps my mind focused on Christ. I said I've memorized dozens of songs, and I have. Probably, I don't want to sound like more than it is, probably about 50. I'm usually saying through those by noon, and I have to start recycling them. Because I get up at 2 or 3 in the morning to go in my private. So I've sang 20 hymns before I've left the house to, to go out for the day. But the importance of you being alone with God is a different thing from being in corporate worship. When you speak or you hear prayers, everybody, I don't care who they are, if I'm asked to pray publicly, 
I can't help but think what people are going to think about what I say. I try not to, but when you get along with God, you get personal with God and bear your soul, it's a different kind of experience and vital in our relationship. It enhances corporate worship and in everything else in your life. I, we used to have a guy that they decided to have the deacons on a rotation do the Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting and message at the church I was at for 20 years. So against their will, <laughs> all of us deacons did that. Me, I'd been doing it for three years, so I didn't have any problem. But this one guy, he was the favorite. He would get done, because we had a preacher that did not, noon was halftime. And this church had been getting out exactly on time since 1888. <laughs> this guy would never talk more than about 15 minutes out of maybe 40 that he had. He was known as Short Sermon Steele. His name was Sidney Steele. Everybody was always requesting him to be able to speak because he was, that's what he did. I never knew that could be done. I mean, I know you follow the Holy Spirit, but I've never seen the Holy Spirit get done early before. <laughs> the Holy Spirit could go on for an hour, but he can't do it in 30 minutes, you know. It really uh, lowered my expectations of what the Holy Spirit can do. But I want to close with this. This is like a campus. 
say that because when I came out and returned to my church, I was not ever treated the same. Not the rank and file. But I've been there for 20 years. I know the church. I know who's making those decisions. And worse yet, I knew them. And it was just a little bit, and I understood that. I hung out about six months hoping to get reestablished in there. We only have one year of that. But I wasn't allowed to get deacon again because churches still hold to divorce people or don't have their house under control and other things that are, are clearly stated in, in Timothy about the qualifications. But I accepted that. I really did. I noticed that the church I was at before that, I was not allowed to be a deacon, and I didn't know the reason why. So I want to track down deacons. And what's going on? And the bylaws say if somebody's got three votes, you have to talk to them. You have to give them a reason. And you have to talk to them. Out of 200 ballots, I was on 196. Nobody. Or this other guy, a friend of mine, he was on the same amount of ballot. Now, I ran across that by accident. I was sitting in an office. I used to motograph. I did everything. If you want to motograph, you can be chairman of the building. It's going to be nice to Almost instantaneous. I would have sent the committees in a month. But nonetheless, I found out later that because my wife had been married, she got into a very bad marriage, very young, and we married because of that, they took that man of one wife, extended to that. And that's not uncommon. But I thought to myself, other people left the church over there. And they couldn't understand and gave me grief that I didn't leave the church. They hurt my body. We used to stand out there and help people park. And we used to ask them if they were divorced or not. We had a separate parking lot for them over there. We deal with that. Or if they put an A on their forehead when they went in, I think it's okay. But let me tell you, wherever you're at, you have to respect your church, the way they interpret doctrine and what the pastor says. I just think you need to know what that doctrine is. Mm -hmm. And this caused way more problems than just owning up to it. But I thought, I'm doing Wednesday night. There's nothing I can't do. All this is is a title. So I don't care what your past is, what you've done. You are not limited to any other way in the eyes of God. The church rightfully and lawfully, whether you agree with it or not, better have better ideas, might have different ideas. So I go back to Mejia's, and he's on every city's good past relations. He answered a letter. This guy said that he wants to do this certain service at a church. And they told him, you're not qualified. Or well, he's divorced. I don't know what the issue is. Okay? But he is very conservative. But he does look at every case. And he told the guy, if you are absolutely sure that God is leading you to do something, then you need to go to a church that will let you. And I've always remembered Church is the body of Christ that is full of human beings and they're not God. Amen. Amen. But again, I want to reiterate you always have to respect the bylaws and the direction of the pastor and the way that he interprets Scripture. And I'm not advocating going against that whatsoever. So I stayed there for a couple of years after that until I moved to a latch one. However, to, to finish this up, I eventually left a church I'd been at for 20 years. And the final straw was I wasn't able, besides not being able to teach, not being able to be a deacon, not being able to do all those things, I could grasp that. I could see how you can use these scripts. But nobody would talk to me. I said, you better give me something to do. I'm telling you, None of us should be. I am not a spectator. So 
So, the God who I knew, who just had a new pastor, this guy was pretty much in control of stuff. He said, I didn't know that. He said, well, we're trying to get you five or eight minutes. I, I don't want to go five or eight minutes. I can't say anything in five or eight minutes. They pretty much were telling me that I wasn't going to have the opportunity to serve anymore. The final straw came. I sucked it up. One day, <coughs> one of the ushers said, Would you help us take up the offering? I said, Praise the Lord, I, you know, I get to do something. This is a breakthrough. <laughs> but then he comes back and he goes, We don't need you, we found somebody else. And I remember that day, I was riding with another lady out of the insurance appointment the next day, and I called him and said, I'm leaving the church. Was I offended? Was I having a pity party? Feelings hurt, probably. But at the same time, that situation wasn't going to work. I wish them well. I love the pastor. I have many friends. But my point of sharing all that is not to share my frustrations necessarily, as much as hopefully, as I try to be for you. But you will understand it doesn't matter in your situation what you've done in the past. Not let anyone tell you that you can't serve the Lord because of what's happened in the past. One truth of Paul, one truth of Peter. There's so many illustrations of church. My name is not short sermon Mike, it's one minute till seven, and I appreciate your service. What does the pastor say? I appreciate your Or what do we do? Okay. I never could really figure out. They just didn't like my voice much. But I had been singing in the church for years and, you know, uh, serving the Lord that way. Um, that's what I feel my gift is. And uh, so time and time again, they had scheduled me to sing a special, um, we called it, and I'd be st sitting on the front row and they'd get done with whatever came right before the special, which came right before the message. And it wasn't a time thing or anything like that. They had just like not even remember that they asked me to sing or see me sitting there and the pastor just come on up and preach. I mean, it happened half a dozen times, right? So I had my little pity party moment and decided, well, if that's the way they feel, I'm just not going to sing. And I pulled out of the choir. Um, I, um, and uh, I think we even stopped going to Sunday school and would just go to, go to um, what, was that, what was that restaurant? Something, some, uh, Village Inn 
Oh, they had great cinnamon rolls. But anyway, um, <laughs> and then go to church. And, but I would still sing in the congregation. So I don't know if that went on six months or a year. And, you know, I was pretty miserable, making myself miserable, you know. And uh, this lady turns around after one congregational service. And I, I think it was a visitor or somebody that didn't know me even. And uh, she turned around to me as we were sitting down and says, you need to be in choir. <laughs> and I said, okay, Lord. <laughs> and... Uh, so I did. I got back in choir, as you can probably tell, and uh, got back involved in in music and and using my gift that I had that I had buried, you know. And uh, uh, it wasn't a long um, period. I don't I don't remember. I said less than a year at least. But that always impacted me. And through that, I uh, came up with sort of a mantra that I will never again let anyone steal my joy. So, I don't know if you've thought about it that way, but it appears you probably have. <laughs> and I want you all to know that too. Don't ever let anybody steal your joy, whatever it is, because God gave you that, and you need, and you need to use it and hold on to it. Bow the knee, trust the heart of the Father, in prayer.